Is there death after Mashiach is going to come? So that's going to be the subject of today's uh, lesson. And hopefully we will walk out with uh, a lot more information than what we know right now. Okay? Excited? You ready? Yeah. Let's begin. Yeah. Isaiah, the famous prophet Isaiah says in Isaiah chapter 25, verse 8, Bila hamoves lonetza, God is going to swallow up. In other words, he will remove death for eternity. Umocha Hashem melekim dimo mi'akoponim, God will wipe away tears from every face. There will be no more death, there will be no more tears. This is what Isaiah says, which seems to tell us that when Mashiach comes, there won't be death. No one's going to die when Mashiach comes. We will live forever. That's what the verse says in Isaiah. Now, the fourth Lubavitch Rebbe, the Rebbe Maharash of Shmuel, he explained in his Hasidic discourse that he began with the caption of quoting this verse from Isaiah that I just quoted about God removing death and tears. And this was in the year, in the 1860s, 1868. And he explained like this. Why is it that in the future, in the Messianic era, there won't be death? What's going to happen then? And he explained the reason for this is because then there won't be any impurity. The spirit of impurity will be removed from the earth. And since there will be no impurity, there will be no death. Which clearly tells us why did death come to the world in the to begin? So we're trying to answer the question, will there be death in the future? So let's go back now. Let's go back in history. Why is there death? Where does death come from? Well, God, as the Mishnah says, Against your will, you're born, and against your will, you die. But when did that start? No one asks you to come here. No one asks you before they, you, you, they take you. Death comes to the world through the sin of the tree of knowledge. Eve and Adam bring death to the world. The first sin brings about death. Prior to the first sin, there was no death. Interesting. But this teaches us that the sin, the first sin, the eating from the tree of knowledge and death are connected one with the other. So let's break this down for a moment. What we're going to share today is a teaching, a chassid discourse that the Rebbe taught in the year 1965. And the fifth of Menachem of, which was actually the day that he finished saying Kaddish for his mother. His mother had passed on the 6th of Tishrei, 1964. In 1965, the 5th of Menachem Ov, it was a leap year that year, he stopped saying Kaddish, and, he, and when he concluded saying Kaddish, he gave over this Hasidic discourse on a Tuesday. So the Rebbe explains like this. The sin of the tree of knowledge was much more than what meets the eye. Because what meets the eye is there was a tree. By the way, it wasn't an apple tree. The whole idea of an apple tree is completely from non-Jewish sources. It most certainly was not an apple tree that some fabricated non-Jew came up with that. It was a tree that had fruit. God told him not to eat. It's all right. So how many times does God tell you not to do something? How many times don't you listen? It happens. We call it a sin, a boo-boo. Even the best of us sin. What happens after that? Does the whole world change? No. Between me and God. If you sin against another person, it's between you and him, you and her. Right? But it doesn't have global impact. Just because a person sitting in Brooklyn, New York sins doesn't mean that a person sitting in, uh, in Bangkok, Thailand or in London, England is affected by my sin. 
Maybe if you want to go really, really deep, you'll say every single action has a ripple effect around the world. But there's nothing apparent that we can see and identify and say, this person, this happened as a result of that individual sin that they did across the globe. No. Certainly you're not going to say that in a thousand years from now, something I did now can affect something in a thousand years from now. But the sin of the tree of knowledge was different because the sin of the tree of knowledge, that sin created something that didn't exist before. And that is what we call the mixture between good and bad. Prior to the sin of eating from the tree of knowledge, there was good, there was godliness, and there was impurity. God created impurity as well. But impurity could not blend, it could not come together in any way with purity. Pure and impure were distinct, separate creations of Hashem. The sin of the tree of knowledge brought about a mixture between these two. In the words of the Kabbalists, the chamber of impurity was below the supernal worlds, meaning there was heavenly worlds, there was heavenly energies, godly energies, there was divinity, and somewhere below there, there was a separate chamber, and it stayed in its chamber. Adam and Eve come along, and they all of a sudden make now a whole new concoction that the world never saw. And this was taruvas, a mixture between good and evil, to the point where from now on, everything is a mixture. There is nothing in the world that doesn't have a blend. All good has a little bit of bad, and all bad has a little bit of good. Excuse me, so the, the mixture, the blend, was not before they um, even ate the apple, ate the, I'm sorry, ate the fruit, but just... Someone's the, paying attention. Yes, Very good, not the apple. Presence. Yes. Huh? Just their presence. No, 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 the sin. The sin, okay. The fact that they that sin, okay. that action of eating of the tree that God said not to eat from this is a tree of knowledge. Don't eat from this tree of knowledge. When they ate from the tree of knowledge, what happened was, yeah. now there became a blend. And this blend had a ripple effect everywhere in the world. There was nothing in existence anymore that didn't have a little bit, something of impurity attached to it, and all good and all bad has a little bit somewhere of good attached to it as well. Now let's go to the Chumash. Now let's go to the Chumash. And here we're going to ask a fascinating question. A fascinating question. Really a fascinating question. On the story in Genesis of this sin. Adam and Eve sinned by eating from the tree of knowledge. Says the verse in Genesis chapter 3 verse 22. What did God say? By Yoyim and Hashem Malikim and God Almighty said, Behold, Man has become like one of us, meaning God is really speaking in in, in the words of the, the commentaries in humble language. Now he knows good and bad. Perhaps he will stretch out his hand. And he will take also from the tree of life. And he will eat from it. And he's going to live forever. So we have a problem. What's the problem now? The problem right now is what? That man will live forever. And therefore, what does God say? God sends him away. God banishes him from the Garden of Eden. Go work the land. No more paradise for you. You're out. Out of here. Why do you throw them out again? Because maybe they're going to eat from the tree of life. And if they eat from the tree of life, they will live forever. They will live forever. That's what the, that's what the verse says. Verse 22, clear. The reason why they were banished from the Garden of Eden is very clear. Lest they eat from the fruit of the tree of life and they live forever. So there were two trees, the tree of knowledge. There were a bunch of trees. There was a tree of life. There was a tree of knowledge. And they were permitted to eat. God said when he introduces Adam to the... To, God says, you can eat from every tree that you see. Just don't eat from one, the tree of knowledge. 
Masif, don't eat from the tree of knowledge. Okay, but now we have a problem. Now that he ate from the tree of knowledge, now he can't eat from the tree of life. So get out of here. Gone. That, that, that's the end of the story. And then he goes on, he throws them out. And basically, that's where we live. We live, we have to work the land now. We don't live in Gan Eden. We don't live in the Garden of Eden anymore. Asks the Alter Rebbe a brilliant question. Man, Adam, mankind was created in the beginning, before the sin of the tree of knowledge. Let's go back. By the way, it was a very short period of time. Adam couldn't control himself. It was only about two hours that it took from, from when he was born till he sinned. So, or when he was created till he sinned. This, was, this all happened in a very short period of time. But we're not, this is not a in-depth class on the timeline of that. But as a side note, the author asks a brilliant question over here. When Adam is created, Adam is created in a way that he's going to live forever. Adam was created initially that he's going to live forever. What is the proof? So what's the problem now? So asks the author. So he'll eat from the tree of life and he'll live forever. Okay, well, what's the problem? In other words, if there was a problem that Adam would live forever, so shouldn't God have told him don't eat from the tree of life to begin with? No, because he didn't have a problem if he lived forever because he was supposed to live forever. So Adam is supposed to live forever. In other words, there is no death. There was no such concept as death. Adam was created as a, as a human being and he was going to live for eternity. Eve was going to live for eternity. So what's the problem now? They eat from the tree of knowledge. Fine, they made a mistake. No, we got to throw you out of here. Why? Because maybe you'll eat from the tree of life and live forever. Well, no kidding. And what's wrong with that? A few hours ago, you thought it was brilliant. That's why you created me this way. So what happened now? This is the author of this question. He doesn't understand. What's the Torah saying? What's God saying over here? We have to throw you out of here, lest you're going to live forever because you eat from the tree. But you created me to begin with to live forever. But not without eating from the tree of knowledge. Correct. Right. Oh, 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 oh. So what do you see from here? What do you see from here? That eating from the tree of knowledge changed everything. It's true. Adam was created to begin with. He was going to live forever. But that was before you sinned. So why does the tree of sin of the tree of knowledge change Adam's lifespan? What does that sin have to do with it? Only this sin? Why? To the point where the author of explains like this. Through the sin of eating from the tree of knowledge, impurity became connected to man. Adam sinned and now he has sinful energy part of him. Mankind is no longer 100% pure. It's now impure. Now, here's the problem. If Adam will live forever, what happens? The impurity within Adam will also live forever. And that, God said, cannot happen. True, I created you, Adam, to live forever. That was when you were holy and pristine. Such a type of holiness goes forever. Impurity was never created to be around forever. It always had a, a shelf life. But now that you attached some impurity to you through this sin, now what's going to happen? Now we got to put you to death. Not right away. But now there's a death sentence on man. Every human being has to die. Which means, what's the reason for death in the world? Not as punishment. Death is not, death is not a punishment. On the contrary, death is the way to remove evil from this world. It's for this reason that God says, it's almost like as a benefit for a time, for a period of time, all human beings are going to have to die in order to remove the spirit of impurity from the human being. 
We do not want impurity and evil to exist forever. This is the basic idea. Everyone understand? You with us? You with us? Good. Yeah. Okay. Now, let's take this. Let's take this a level deep. We can say, it's fair to say, it's appropriate to say that death, which came about through the sin of eating from the tree of knowledge, is a direct result from the sin itself. To explain this, life, chayus, the word in Hebrew is chayus, energy, a life force, is only found in holiness. Real life and holiness and divinity. Impurity doesn't have real life. It's death. It doesn't have, a re it's a parasite. It doesn't have its own life force. It only lives off of what it can, as we would say in Yiddish, cha, only what it can suck out of something holy. But it's at its core, it doesn't have real life. It's the opposite of life. God is life. God is the true life. So anything godly has life. Anything that's not godly doesn't have real life. If this is the case, if this is the case, we explain like this. Since through the sin of eating from the tree of knowledge, evil, impurity, attached itself to man, it grabbed onto man, which this is what we would call spiritual death, right? It's like, oh, we got, we got struck with a level of spiritual death. So then what happens is, what evolved from the spiritual death is also what we call physical death. So that the sin itself, in other words, impurity itself is a, is a spiritual death. So if you attach spiritual death to something and it sticks, from there will evolve real death as well, physical death as well. Now let's go back to where we began. In the, in the time of Mashiach, when Mashiach is going to come, what did Isaiah say? Isaiah said, Bilam of Esnonetzach, death will be removed, will be banished from this earth for eternity. Why? Why won't there be death after Mashiach comes? Because when Mashiach comes, there will no longer be evil. Evil, spiritual impurity, spiritual death will be removed because spiritual death will be gone. So then there will be no longer physical death as well because physical death is only a direct result of spiritual death, impurity clinging to us. Which leaves us now with the following thing to understand. Why when Mashiach comes, won't there be any impurity. What's going to happen then that we don't have now? That's going to remove all the impurity. All the evil will be eradicated. Now that evil is gone, now automatically if you remove the cause, so automatically the effect falls away. Remove spiritual death, automatically the effect of that, which is the physical death, will be gone as well. And for this, he explains, because when Mashiach comes, there's going to be an unbelievably extraordinary revelation of godliness. And in the space of this unbelievable, extraordinary revelation of godliness, all opposition will automatically become nullified. Imagine for a moment the greatest force that you can think of that you've ever come into contact with. I don't mean uh, nuclear energy because no one's no one's actually tampered with that. But 
Imagine the sun for a second. The sun is probably the most powerful thing that uh, that we that we know of that we that, that, that we could connect to. Can you imagine a you know a massive waterfall, Niagara Falls, something like something like this. just has energy that there is nothing that can stop it. It's so powerful. There is nothing in existence that can possibly stop it. So any force that you think would stop it, it when it, when you put it in front of it, what happens to it? It disintegrates automatically. It's it's gone. It obliterates it. There's nothing there. And imagine now you amplify that and make that across the globe, that energy across the globe, meaning it's impossible for there to be any type of opposition. There's no opposing force to godliness when Mashiach comes because the revelation is just going to be so powerful. It's impossible. Everything will be gone. In the face of such a type of a revelation, the opposing forces, they just disappear. They just don't exist. That's the explanation. So when Mashiach comes, there's this wild, unimaginable revelation of God, which will remove any type of opposing force to godliness that it, it, won't, it, will, it won't exist. So let's try to break this down a little bit, as he does in the Rebbe Marash's letter. And he explains like this. If we're being honest with ourselves, and we give a look at history, we'll know that we used to have two temples. And we, in these two temples, there was what we say, a massive revelation of God. So yes, the second temple was missing a lot of the qualities of the first temple. So it was a diminished revelation. So let's focus on the first temple. And in the first temple itself, certainly in the times of King Solomon. King Solomon is described, his era is described as Kaim Masiya Abashtamus was a full moon. It was like perfection. King Solomon was, the Jews never had a better time, not before and not since, than in the times of King Solomon. The base of Mitish, the holy temple was there. And there was just revealed godliness in the world. He walked into the temple, as the Mishnah says, you observe 10 open miracles at every moment in the temple. This was a, it was a godly space. And from there, the godliness radiated to the rest of the world. There was still death. There was still death. So if death is a result of impurity, and over here we're saying Mashiach comes, there'll be a massive revelation of God which will automatically remove and vanquish any type of semblance of impurity which will mean that we don't so then well, why did what happened during times of Solomon as a matter of fact during the times of King Solomon the revelation of God was so powerful and this is the reason why we say that it was the best time for the Jews then because no one went to war with the Jewish people. Which means any opposing force, when someone goes to war with you, that means there's an, a force that's coming to attack you. Right? That's an opposing force coming to attack you. Times of peace means, why is there peace? Peace only comes from strength. It doesn't exist. Peace does not from nothing. If, no, if someone's not afraid of you, then they're just going to trample upon you. So why did no one mess with the Jewish people in the times of Solomon? Because of this powerful force that was so powerful that it caused a complete subjugation of the non-Jews around that no one even thought about going to war with Solomon, with the Jewish people, with King Shlomo. Nevertheless, there was that. Why? So we have to explain that there's a, there's a difference between the revelation that was in the temple, in the first temple, even in King Solomon's days, and what's going to happen with Mashiach. In the revelation, the difference is what the Kabbalists call 
Nikas Achitzayna means sucking from the backside. What does it mean? And Tanya explains, when you want to give something to someone, how do you give it to them? I want to give you a gift. So I, get, I buy a gift, whatever it is. And I go over to you and I say, Brandon, I bought something I want to share with you. They want to, I want to give you a gift, right? And you give it to the person. In other words, the time it's done face to face. You give them looking at the person, and you give it to them. When you have something that you have to give to someone that you don't want to give it to them, you don't, for whatever reason, you don't want to give it to them. How do you do it? The time explains this you give, you turn your back on them. You give it from your backside. Send it by Amazon. <laughs> Even that's too good. <laughs> you want to show them almost like I'm forced to give this to you. But you don't know that it's not for you. This doesn't belong in your possession. But something is compelling me that I have to give this to you and that's why it's going to or that's what's directed to you but really it's not for you. That's called general kinds of the level of the backside. We call some Kabbalistic terms the level of the backside which means there's two ways to receive energy from God. There's the face-to-face, -face, the energy you deserve. And then there's the energy that you don't deserve. But there's the unika, there's a little bit of a of a sucking from the backside. It's not even, and there's, there's myriads of levels in this. But at a, at, at a simple level of understanding in the times of King Solomon, impurity was still around but it was weakened it was weakened so severely that no one even thought about going to war there was no opposing force that reared its ugly head they were completely put to bed in a real way put to bed they were totally um, overwhelmed by the by the greatness of the revelation that was taking place at that time of the first holy temple. But at the same time, it wasn't completely eradicated. And you see this in the days of Solomon in, in an interesting way. As he, he gives one example of this. There was a non-Jewish queen. Her name was the Queen Shavu. That was the name. She was lived not in Israel. She lived in her own territory close by. And she heard about Solomon's greatness. Everyone heard about Solomon's greatness, which is part of the revelation that, that was at, at, in existence at the time. And because of hearing, just hearing, she lived in her place. She heard about Solomon's greatness. This brought about a level of what we call Beetle, a level of nullification on her part. She felt inferior, and which brought her to pick herself up and travel to Shlom. That's a big deal. In the world today, you know, there's visits of heads of state, an official visit of a head of state. You know, it's a big deal. Every time a head of state comes to visit, they make a big deal about it. For someone to just pick themselves up, I said, I want to come to you, to come visit you as a head of state. That basically is telling you they need you. And they'll do whatever you want. If they're ready to pick themselves up and travel just to meet with you. So she came. She came to visit Shlomo. And when she visits Shlomo, she has a conversation and they meet and she is completely overtaken by his greatness, by his wisdom. To the point where she like, in the words, the way they describe it is, she had no spirit of her own. You know, like when you're in the face of greatness and she completely lost herself. She was completely absorbed in the greatness of Solomon. That's almost like what we're talking about, how in the face of a powerful, powerful revelation, everything is completely absorbed in that there is no opposing force to it. So this queen, which could have been an opposing force, 
hears about the greatness of Solomon, just hearing about Solomon causes a certain level of nullification that she decides on her own to go visit Solomon. And when she visits him, she's even more overwhelmed by his greatness to the point where she's like, all yours. But nevertheless, nevertheless, we still call her a queen. The fact that we still call her a queen indicates to us that she still had, she still did have her own identity. And on top of that, Solomon himself showed her tremendous respect. So King Solomon, the greatest of the great, showed this queen great respect, which teaches us that although, yes, she was an opposing force which was completely disarmed, so to speak, she had no strength to fight. She had no interest to fight. But she was completely overwhelmed by his greatness. But nevertheless, she, she had still her own identity. She wasn't completely absorbed. She wasn't completely eradicated. She was still her. That was the revelation during the times of Shlomo. However, when Mashiach comes, in the future when Mashiach comes, there will be no yinika sachit there will be no sucking from the backside. There will be zero, complete cutoff of energy, 100% cutoff of the godly energy. It will be strictly directed to the right places, which would then automatically cut the life force off of evil, which will bring about the, the prophecy of Isaiah. Bilam of God will eradicate death for eternity. Before the class, guys was talking about uh, Israel, right? Okay. Bless him. Thank you. Thank you. Sure. Sure. This is what, if you want to remove, eradicate evil, there's only one way to do it. You have to cut off the supply chain. As long as the supply chain is still alive, so then it will automatically have a place and an existence. You may put it to bed for a few days or for a few months or for a few years. But if the supply chain is still alive and active, it will once again rear its ugly head. There's only one way to stop it. You have to cut the supply chain completely. Absent that, there's no victory. The only way for, for there to be the removal of death, the prophecy of Isaiah, is if Life, which is Kedusha, holiness is life, cannot find its way to anything other than where it belongs. The life force for unholiness to be cut off completely, which didn't and wasn't in the time of Solomon. It was still some type of underground tunnel that they were able to get drip, drip, drip from. I mean this metaphorically speaking. And that identity that they retained, their self-image that they still held on to, that was enough that after Solomon passes and after a few years, then everything changed. The next generation already, the enemies came back and the Jews started fighting and they were about the enemies to start fighting and then eventually troubles once again. This is the general idea I'm going to go now a level deeper than this. If you're ready for it. Okay. Which will help us, on, it's deeper, but also will help us understand. And Tanya explains, we're going to, we're, what, we're going, what we're doing now is we're trying to explain and further understand this difference between the revelation that was there during the times of Solomon versus the revelation that's going to be when Mashiach comes. It's a subtle difference. The very nuanced difference. So he explains like this. In the service of man to God. Now we're not global. Now we're going, zooming in on me. Every individual. Let's focus on me and you. A regular, functioning human being. There's something what we call steward made up, which means refrain from all evil. And then there's what's called Moe 
Moist Pura means he despises all evil. Two levels. The one who refrains from evil and the one who despises evil. What's the difference between these two people? If we give you a title, if we give you the official title, we put on you the crown as someone who refrains from all evil. Or we give you the crown and the title of someone who despises evil. What is the practical difference between these two? The answer is there is no. Practically speaking, there is no. What do I mean by that? Both of them will never do anything wrong. If you do something wrong, then you can't have the title of someone who, who, who refrains from evil. Because <laughs> you don't refrain from evil. So no, obviously both of them never do anything against the will of God. They never they never engage with anything that's in evil. So what is the practical difference between these things, between these two categories? The difference between these two categories is completely internal. You need a spiritual microscope to go and do an x-ray to see what's going on within the person, deep, 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 deep down within the person. The one who is what's called Sur Merah, the one who refrains from evil, 100% always pushes away anything evil that comes their way. Always. They will never, ever engage with anything evil. However, deep, deep, deep down inside, they still hold a place for evil. There's a space inside of them that's open for it. They never act upon it. They control themselves. Maybe they train themselves that they don't even need to control themselves, as I'll give you an example in a minute. But because deep, deep, deep down somewhere in the recesses of their soul, in their, in their brain, there's a space for evil, that leads to actually a little bit of a interest in evil. A little bit of a desire and temptation and a love for you. They'll never act on it. But deep down, if you can put it under the x-ray and the micro, you'll see. Versus the person who despises evil. The moye spirit, the one who despises evil. There's no room for evil. On the contrary, they hate it and they despise it. With every fiber of their being, you're not going to find any part of it. Let's take, for example, like this. There's some, well, we, there's, uh, there's um, allergies. Different types of allergies out there. Right? Deadly allergies. Some, some of them are deadly. Right? Someone, God forbid, is allergic to uh, peanuts. Peanuts, let's say. No. Allergic to peanuts. How, you doing, how, do, how does one find out they're allergic to peanuts? They get sick. <laughs> From what? From peanuts. Oh, it means they had to taste them one time. <laughs> yeah. It means they tasted a peanut one time. Hmm. So it's, it's a little bit difficult to give the example. You tasted a peanut. You come to the doctor, and the doctor tells you you're allergic to peanuts. Right? So now what? Never go near a peanut again. You will never go. Why? Because you know, I touch a peanut, I'm dead. I'm so allergic. I touch a peanut, I'm dead. It was a miracle that I didn't die the last time. This person will never, ever, ever cross that line and eat a peanut. Not only that, they won't go on a plane that has a peanut. They won't go on a train if there's a peanut. They're so careful with everything that they go near in every room that they enter. There's peanut-free zones everywhere. Why? For this reason. So in the beginning, it's a, it may be a, a fight, a struggle. I like a peanut. Tastes good. You know, last time it was, it was, I would like to have it. So there's a, but then you train yourself eventually that it's not, it's not a struggle. I mean, crazy. It's a struggle. It's your life on the line. There's no peanut. It's not happening, right? So you go over to someone and say, oh, are you tempted by a peanut? No. I'm, no, I'm not tempted anymore by a peanut. No way. 
So this person will never eat a peanut. Right? Let's go versus another type of individual now. This person may not be allergic to peanuts. They just hate peanuts. They it makes them gag and throw up, not be, not from an allergic reaction. It's just they cannot stand the taste of a peanut. So they will never eat a peanut also, right? Both of these people outwardly behave the same way. They don't go near peanuts. They stay away from peanuts to make sure nothing has a peanut in it. Outwardly, you would never know the difference between these two people. The difference is simply what's going on internal. So it's a totally internal difference. One person, there is zero space for a peanut in their life because they hate peanuts. They will never, ever, ever touch a peanut. The other person, yeah, they hate peanuts now. But inside, deep, deep down inside, maybe there's room for a peanut. <laughs> I will never go there. But maybe there's room. In other words, there's a space for a peanut inside me. And therefore, because there's a space inside, it can lead itself also to a temptation for a peanut. This is the difference between the tzaddik who is complete, as he describes in Tanya, versus the tzaddik which is incomplete, as described in Tanya. The tzaddik who is complete despises and hates anything that's not godly. Their behavior for sure is perfect. But besides the behavior, behavior being perfect, internally, they're just wired in a way that if it's not godly, I despise it. I hate it in the most strongest way possible. The incomplete tzaddik is the tzaddik, which there's, there's millions of levels. How much do you hate? How much do you refrain from peanuts? You know, lots of people are a little allergic to peanuts. No two are exactly the same. There's thousands and thousands and thousands and thousands of levels in the incomplete tzaddik. But the common theme among all of them is behavior, they'll never cross the line. They'll never ever do something tzaddik. They'll never do something behave ungodly. Excuse me. But inside of them, there may be room for something which is ungodly. They'll never know. It's impossible to know. So practically, there's no difference. But internally, from God's perspective, there is a difference. And from the person themselves, there's also a difference. Incomplete tzaddik works on themselves to become the complete tzaddik. They want to reach the level of, I completely despise it because it's ungodly as well. And this is the difference. This idea is the difference between the revelation that existed in the times of Solomon versus the revelation that's going to be in the times of Mashiach. The, re the revelation that was there during the times of Solomon, it's true. Because of the greatness of this revelation, all of the opposing forces were squashed, right? As we mentioned earlier. But that's similar to the incomplete Sadiq who pushes away all evil. It, their behavior is, is, is the same. They'll never transgress, right? But there's inside a little bit of space that still remains for this for themselves, for something which isn't exactly 100% God. What we call the unique Asafitsanian, there's room for there, for there to be an impure force that can still, like a parasite, suck off the backside of the godly energy. However, when Mashiach comes, the revelation then is going to be such a type of a revelation similar to the one who hates and despises evil with a total, in the, I don't know any stronger word to use than that which we've already used, which compared to that, there is nothing, there is no room for anything that's not God. With such a type of revelation, there's no space for anything that's not God. So it's a subtle difference. To the naked eye, you may not be able to see the difference. And therefore, you may ask the big question, what do you mean a great revelation? So if all great revelations automatically bring about the eradication of death, so then how come Mashiach in Solomon's times it was? You had a, it's a subtle nuance difference. You're right. You're 100% right. It was a great revelation during the times of Solomon. But that great revelation only put the opposition 
to bed, but still allows for there to be a little bit of to retain their own identity of the whole. To retain the identity of evil that has no power. What happened was because the life force wasn't supply wasn't cut off completely, there was 0.1 of an opening, they were able to come back from there. But in times of Mashiach, it will be a 100% shutdown. We can go a little further than this. And we can explain. He explains in chapter, in chapter, um, in chapter 10 of Tanya, that the greater, the level of, um, how should we say it? The more one despises evil is corresponding to their level of love to Hashem. The greater you love Hashem, the more you're going to despise something which is opposite of what Hashem wants. This is in every relationship. The greater you love someone else, the more you're going to behave according to what they desire. If you're not behaving according to their desire, well, this is an indication that the love isn't there either. So now it comes out that the difference between the one who pushes away the evil versus the one who despises evil is corresponding, it's commensurate with how much they love Hashem. So the greater the one who loves Hashem more is the one obviously who despises the evil. The one who only pushes away what's called Surmeda. He pushes away all the evil. He has a lesser degree of love for Hashem. So now let's apply this again to the times of Solomon versus the times of Mashiach and the times of Solomon. Since there was a lacking, it wasn't 100% in the love for Hashem, that's why everything flows from there. It wasn't a 100% love for Hashem, which means it wasn't 100% of a hate for evil, which led to there still remaining a little bit of a opening for them, which led to eventually them coming back versus the time of Mashiach, where the love for Hashem is going to be 100%. Therefore, there will be 100% of our um, uh, hate for anything that's not Hashem, which will lead to 100% cut off of all impurity, which will lead to the fulfillment of the prophecy of Isaiah. This is all the background. And with this, we can end right now. And this gives us enough of a background to understand the prophecy of Isaiah. And what the logic, if you will, from a Hasidic perspective is to this prophecy of Isaiah. But we're going to be left with one question. And that is the following. And this is really, perhaps we can say what's most important. Because still now we're talking about maybe a Hasidic philosophy. What does it have to do with life today? What difference did everything we say make to you? So now you know where death comes from and when there won't be death when Mashiach comes. Okay. So now what? Want to bring about Mashiach, Mashiach. Oh, very good. You want to bring about Mashiach. So let's understand that. Brilliant. How do we bring about Mashiach? Make the world a better place. When you say we want to bring about Mashiach, which means what he's saying is we want to bring about this awesome revelation of Hashem. Mashiach means there'll be this awesome revelation of Hashem. Well, how do we get to this awesome revelation of Hashem? Where is this revelation of Hashem going to come from? Well, the answer is, the revelation of Hashem is going to come from based off of our behavior now, during a time of exile. Every revelation in the future is a result of our behavior and our work now in the time of exile. So we're creating our own revelation. That's the way it works. So if we're going to bring about this revelation of the total eradication of evil, Isaiah's prophecy, no more death in the world whatsoever, right? How do we do that? The only way we do that is, as he explains in the Hasidic discourse, the Rav Marash, through the Jewish people, 
despising and hating evil with a 100% level of hate, leaving zero room, and zero means zero room for anything ungodly, this then in turn will bring about that God, as the verse says, there's Esau, son Esau, and I hate and I despise Esau. And because of this hate that Hashem has for Esau, God is going to remove the spirit of impurity, the spirit of Esau, which is the spirit of impurity, and then automatically, once the spirit of impurity is removed, there's nothing ungodly. So now there will be Isaiah's prophecy. There's only one problem with this, and that is, Who's going to live forever when Mashiach comes? Everyone. The verse says, God's going to remove death completely from the earth. There'll be no death for anybody. But according to what we just said, who is the only people that deserve to live forever? Those who despise hate. Now, in the current lifetime, in the current exile, if you do what you need to do, which is the 100%, Love for Hashem, which means 100% hate for anything that's ungodly, so that you'll bring about a revelation in the future that's commensurate with that. But if you're not holding on that level, so then how do you tap into the level of Mashiach comes? But the, Isaiah said it's for everybody. So there has to be a way for everybody to tap into it. So how can we tap into this? How can we possibly tap into this Mashiach uh, eternal life? If we're not holding today, if we're honest, on the level of a complete tzaddik, we're not even holding on the level of a incomplete tzaddik. We're not even holding on the level of the Abdul Rebbe calls a banning an intermediate individual. We're all evil. What we call Russia, we're all evil. At best, we're a good evil guy. We're good evil people. We try to do the right thing, but we know we fail all the time. So how can we possibly tap into the highest level if we're not holding that? And Isaiah seemed to make as if it's for everybody. So we're included in everybody. So how does this work? And over here, the Rebbe tells us a fascinating idea. It's really a really fascinating idea. He gives us a number of options of how we can do it. And he says like this, every single Jew has certain times. And then he goes on to say what those times are either during prayer or during studying Torah or during you doing a mitzvah that you really enjoy, you really take special pride in this mitzvah, or even if it's during your business, your daily work life, but it's for the sake of heaven, or even more than that, if it's during your work, your regular work, whatever that is, but you do it in a way that you see the hand of God. You search and you find the hand of God in every part of your work. And during this period of time, you are completely immersed, totally 100% involved and engaged in whatever it is that you're doing. Let's understand this for a second. You're doing a mitzvah. You're doing prayer. Let's say prayer for a second. You come to shul and you pray. So what happens is you walk into shul, the first thing you do is you grab a talus, you grab a siddur, you sit down. Until right. so you get comfortable, it takes you a little bit. Find the right place, page, okay. What about, how, how's my mood this morning? Sometimes you come to daven, but it doesn't, it doesn't flow from the heart. When davening is over, it was a good social experience, hopefully. But I can't say it was a truly spiritual experience. But sometimes you come to Dava, and for whatever reason, you're really locked in. You're really locked in on, on a certain paragraph or a certain prayer or a certain something. And when you were in that moment, when you were in that, when you were locked in, it could have been for 30 seconds, a minute, it could have been any amount of time. The amount of time is irrelevant. But there were moments where you were 100% locked in where you didn't even realize what was going on around you. You just forgot. It was, could be five seconds. But because you were in it for five seconds, you were present, 100% present. There was nothing else in the world that existed for those couple of seconds. 
the, the better ones among us, they can train themselves to, to do this for longer than that. But you don't have to. It can even be for one second. Or you're studying, you're studying, and you and you immerse yourself in the study to the point where you forget what time it is. You, you, you meant you were doing for one minute, the next thing you know, it's 20 minutes later. It happens with things that are not godly. But when it happens with things that are godly, or you're doing the mitzvah, and you're so engaged in the mitzvah that you didn't even care how much money it cost you. You didn't care about anything else. I doesn't make any sense. Why are you spending this amount of money on this mitzvah? Why are you, why are you so excited? Why are you not losing? Why? You're 100% <clears throat> in the Yiddish it's called you all give off of yourself over 100%. You're immersed, totally immersed in, in this project. That's where you're found. Where, like I said, it could be even during, during your work day. Where you do, where in your work, you realize you find the hands of Hashem in the phone calls and the meetings and the work that you're doing. It's a different type of a service because it's not, it's not a quote unquote holy, but it's a very, it, it can be and it is a very holy experience. And during these moments, this is the key over here. During those five seconds, 20 seconds, 30 seconds, whatever it is, a couple of minutes, all dirty garments, what the Kabbalists call the dirty garments, are removed from you because you're immersed 100% in holiness. And for those couple of seconds, you are now a complete sign. Short-lived, very short-lived. But for that, whatever, however that period of time is, you're now a short, you're, you're a complete solid. So now, from our perspective, me and you, we look at everything in life as a matter of time. So five seconds ago, I was evil. Five seconds from now, I'm also going to be evil. So what difference does the five seconds now in middle make? It's just five seconds. So yeah, it was great. It was a great spiritual experience. But I would never define myself by these five seconds. It was just five seconds of my life. But here's, the, here's where you have to stop for a moment and realize that from God's perspective, God transcends time. Past, present, and future doesn't exist in heaven. And by God, that doesn't, there's no such thing. That's just merely a creation of Hashem. So your yichud, what the Kabbalists call your union, your bond, that you were immersed for, those, for that moment, that lasts for eternity. In God's in God's eyes, that's an eternal mitzvah. It's frozen, right there. Like you in the video, whatever it is, you stop, you pro, you pause, and you freeze that screen. That lives on forever. So now, we understand how every single one of us can actually become a complete tzaddik, and why each and every one of us will merit the prophecy of Isaiah. Because each and every one of us can relate to what it means to be a complete tzaddik for a short period of time, from our perspective. But God takes that and, and freezes that frame, and that lives on forever. That's eternal in God's eyes. Because time is just a limitation of creation. We got it? There's one more paragraph to this, which gets into a very beautiful. Uh, it gets into a very beautiful idea. I'll just say it quickly. I'll just say it quickly. This is why what we say is going to be Bila Mavis on that stuff, the eradication of uh, all death forever, because as long as there's still sparks out there that have to be elevated, that means there's still a mixture of good and bad in the world. As long as there's still a mixture of good and bad, that means they haven't completed the job. Evil still exists. It's still attached itself to things that are holy. And therefore, even during the times of the temple, even during the times of King Solomon, there's still the idea of death. Death still exists in the world because there's still a mixture of good and bad that exists in the world. In order for there, why, did God, why does God give death? Because death is the solution to removing the evil from the world. Now, there's an idea that says that righteous people, before the resurrection of the dead, they'll have to, their bodies will have to return to the earth. 
even the righteous people, their bodies are going to have to return to the earth one moment before the resurrection of the dead. You have to understand. Why? Why does they have to do this? And the answer is because the body is a body in the physical world. So even though it was a tzaddik's body, yes, it's true, it was a tzaddik's body, but nevertheless, it needs to have some type of refinement. Just like death is, brings about the removal of evil from the world. So yes, this tzaddik doesn't, never did anything evil, but just the fact that it's a soul and a body, that in and of itself is a certain, means it has a certain, it was contaminated, so to speak, on, on a very sophisticated level, but it was somewhat contaminated. It needs to go through a refining process, which is why the, the body of a tzaddik has to return back to the earth just for one moment before the resurrection of the dead. But when Mashiach comes in the future, after there's going to be the, after the resurrection of the dead, until there is before the resurrection of the dead, everything in the world needs to be refined, even the body of a tzaddik. But after the resurrection of the dead, when people will be returned to the living, then the body will no longer need to go through any process of refinement because then evil will have been removed from the earth completely. And then we will have Bilam of Isaiah's prophecy, will have eternal life. Now, there is an opinion that says that there's a verse. A verse is from Isaiah that says, almost the lad after 100 years will die. Meaning, seeming to say that after Mashiach comes, there will be some type of death. So some learn it doesn't mean literally. It doesn't mean that literal death. But there is an opinion that says, no, it means literal death. So Rabbi said that actually refers to non-Jews. Not just will be around in time of the shift, but they will have death. But don't think it means physical death either for them. This is where the Rebbe comments, don't know, even them. It doesn't mean physical death. What it means is they'll have a nephila, and nephila means they'll fall down. And it's brought down. Someone who falls, someone who was a high level, and they fell down. And someone who was a you know, respected individual, but they fell in shame and disgrace. It's like death, it's a death sentence for them. That's what it means that some they'll be on a higher level, but they'll fall. It doesn't mean physically they'll die, but it means that they'll have a, dis, a level of disgrace, so to speak, that it will be like a death sentence, but it's not going to be a literal death sentence for them either. What does it mean? It means like this. Through that, the godly spark which is in them will be refined from them, from within them, and then elevated from them. So what's going to happen is the evil within them is going to fall down. In other words, like when you separate, when you go through a recycling process or they take different materials and the machines today, they can uh, sift through and, and, and move all the materials of something, right? You know what I'm talking about? So the holiness of it is going to be elevated. So what's going to happen to the unholiness of it? Which means the body, the physical element is going to fall down. That's what it means. That uh, a lad after a hundred years will die, it means he'll have a falling, a falling down because the spiritual will be elevated. So the physical is going to fall down. But for the Jewish people, however, for the Jewish people, even their body is going to have an elevation. Just like the spiritual side will have an elevation, the body is going to have an elevation as well. Just like the soul is nourished from spirituality, the body, the Jewish body, is also going to be nourished from spirituality. To the point where the body is actually going to be on a higher level than the soul. Now we view life as the soul is holy, the body is unholy. But when Mashiach comes, actually the body will be revealed that the body is actually on a higher level than the soul. As in the words of the verse in Jeremiah, in the cave of the Sefer Geber. And this is all going to be in a reality in this world with the coming of the Mashiach Tzidkenu, with the immediate and the swift redemption of the Jewish people may happen speedily in our days. Amen. Great. Anyone have any questions on this? So the definition of evil is... Oh,